Welcome to this talk um, about stateful functions. Um, this is, as Fabian already mentioned, this is a sub-project under the Apache Flink umbrella. Um, it's heading more or less in, in a new direction for what um, stream processing can be used for beyond um, data streaming analytics. So we just released the 3.0 newest version of stateful functions with some major changes, but this talk will be more or less a introductory talk for new users in general to give you an idea of what exactly stateful functions is. And because of we have around 20 minutes or 30 minutes or so, so we wouldn't be able to go into too much into detail, but the major takeaways would be, you would know what a stateful function application looks like and um, how you could maybe start with trying out POCing, POCing with stateful functions. Um, you can just call me Gordon. Um, I'm currently a Flink PMC member in the Apache Flink community. And for the past uh, few years, I've been working on various areas in the Flink project, including ecosystem connectors, uh, the type serialization stack, upgradability of stateful streaming applications, and most importantly, um, in the recent uh, one or two years or so, working on the stateful functions project exclusively. Okay, um, right, so the agenda for today, um, we'll just be covering, covering three major topics. First of all is what exactly is stateful functions and the big idea behind it. Um, stateful functions is actually targeted towards more general application developers, but this being, this talk being in a stream track, it actually has some relevance with stream processing because we are borrowing some big ideas from stream processing into the application development space. Uh, second of all, we'll give, uh, we'll take a quick brief overview of, um, what code you would write with a stateful function application and how you would maybe deploy it um, for quick examples. And last of all, um, we can take a quick overview of what you might be able to expect in some upcoming major versions, let's say 3.1 or 3.2, but don't. Uh, but it, it would be an estimation because this would all be based on what exactly um, some user feedback is asking for in the Apache Flink mailing lists for, for stateful functions. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with what exactly is stateful functions. Um, if you've read our documentation before, there is one very simple sentence to put it. Um, it is a stack consisting of various language SDKs and a runtime for user developers, uh, for users to develop, to more easily develop um, distributed stateful applications, and also more easily operate these distributed stateful applications. But what exactly does that mean? Um, I think this would be most easiest to, to explain by actually going through an overview of an, the act architecture of what a stateful function application actually looks like. So, what is stateful functions? Stateful functions. Well, right off the bat, um, you would build state fund applications using functions. Now, these functions are essentially a small piece of logic that represents entities within your application. Now, to to motivate this, let's. Um, the previous talk actually used a similar uh, example, so I think this is a good follow up. Um, so let's say, let's imagine you have a shopping cart application. Right. And what entities would be in this application? You would have user cards, you would have an inventory function, and you might also have a fraud detection service in charge of detecting any fraudulent activities, um, payment activities from, from some user, from some specific user, right? And let's say that this application sits behind some front end web UI to actually um, drive the these, these shopping cart um, backend. Now, these individual functions, it would be implemented with various language SDKs. Now, stateful function um, provides, but officially supports um, two SDKs. One is Java and one is Python. Um, and these would be 
running behind standalone HTTP services. Now, I'll go through the code, um, some code snippets um, in a sec to actually show you what that exactly means, how to expose these functions through an actual HTTP server. But for now, you just need to picture that these are just separate processes um, exposed, exposing their functions and their function logic behind a HTTP service endpoint. That's all you need to know for the time being. Now, to actually express your logic uh, for your shopping cart application, what you would do is actually define messages that are being passed from the outside world, which is, let's say, our web front-end web UI, into this application, and also in between functions, in between these entities of our application. So let's picture that um, you have a web UI, and the user, the user um, clicks. I want to add a specific item to, um, let's say, Joe's user card. Okay, Joe does this. He, he wants to add a pair of socks to, to his card. This event being sent to the user card function, it would um, resolve into several follow-up functions being sent from the user card to, uh, follow-up messages, sorry, from the user card to, let's say, the inventory function. So let's say uh, the user card function of Joe now sends a message to inventory function socks, but I want to reserve some amount of socks. Okay. Now the inventory function might uh, do some things like it checks its um, state. Do I actually have enough um, quantity uh, to to fulfill this reservation? If I do, I acknowledge this reservation, send a message back to user Joe, and say, okay, you can go ahead and add this to your user card. Okay, and um, let's imagine now that the web UI has a follow-up click event to say uh, proceed to checkout. Um, this is sent to the user card function, which in turn also sends an event, a checkout event maybe, to a fraud detection uh, service to handle this specific checkout, which might then result in um, this checkout uh, succeeds or based on some user history activity for user Joe, um, this, this payment is, is not allowed. So this is just a very oversimplified idea of what entities mean in, in your application and how logic is, is implemented via message passing, message passing. Okay, now one thing we can already mention um, with this it would even be more tangible once we see uh, what the code looks like is that messaging between functions is completely transparent. Now, what that means is we don't, for example, use a card function sending a message to the inventory function. We don't need to know the physical address of the inventory function where it is actually deployed. We just need to know the logical address of um, where we want our messages to be sent to. So application developers uh, of, let's say, the user card function, it just needs to know uh, the logical address, which is consists of two information. One is the type of the function. The second is the ID of the instance of that function it wants to invoke. Okay. So in this example, uh, one logical address would be inventory socks, and socks being the ID, and inventory being the type of a function. That is a logical address, and that is all you need to know in order to send a message to another function. Okay, so every, all the routing of the messages is completely transparent in user code space. Now, the next, uh, which you might have already observed, is that this whole logic is, it is stateful, right? The computation is stateful. For example, the user card, the state is obviously um, what items are already reserved in a user's cart. And uh, for the inventory function, the state would be how many, um, Socks. How many? How many of each inventory do I have for each? Uh, do I have left? Right. I have a fraud detection function. The state. It could be um, the history of user activity. Okay. So this is the state of this application. Now this is where things get interesting, right? Because we all know um, that handling distributed applications with state, it gets much much more complex um, beyond is as if, if it were stateless, right? Now, to actually explain how stateful functions handles this for the user, so that is completely transparent and the user does not need to worry about it, uh, the application developer does not need to worry about it, I want to slightly branch out um, a bit into this slide here. 
So let's quickly go through how normally um, nowadays for applications, how do they actually handle messaging and consistency of state? So let's say you have an application, which this, this diagram is just um, a abstraction of what we're going through with our shopping cart, where one application, it might be broken up into several independent services. And each service would have their own database um, to, man to maintain the state of that individual service, right? And when one service gets invoked, it could do a few, several, a few um, several things. For one, it could update its own state in the database. Second, it might invoke another service to receive some information. And invoking that other service, it might in turn also let that service update its own state. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. And this is nice because in the compute tier, what happens in this architecture is that in the compute tier, it doesn't contain any state. State is all, um, is all kept in the database layer. But of course, we know that in reality, it's never just that simple. It gets much more complex when you start considering what happens in the case of, of some failure, right? Let's say the message invocation from service one to service two actually fails. Now, what exactly do the application tier needs to consider now? For example, application one, it needs to consider, should I re- should I re send a send another uh, retry request to application two? If I do that, does application two actually handle this um, duplicate invocations item potent? And this is all concerns that needs to be considered that makes this scenario more complex uh, than we really want it to be. Right now, this is the point where several functions is actually borrowing. Um, a technique that we've been using in stream processing for several years up to now already, which is bundling, um, handling messaging and state updates um, coherently within a single system. Okay, so that, that's the basic idea. Um, so you can picture this. Let's say we handle the message not in the application tier, but actually in, let me actually see if I can bring out my laser pointer. So we don't have, we don't handle the messaging in the computer, but we handle it in the storage tier. Now what that means is, um, abstraction wise, what that means is, let's say one database handles the input event, it knows that this input event should be routed to some service compute tier, uh, some compute process. Now with this routing of that input message to that service, it also carries state that is relevant for that specific input event, okay? Now the compute here receives the message and the state that goes with it. It does a few things, it has some side effects. And these side effects, um, more concretely, concretely speaking, would be updating, maybe updating the state and also sending also some um, extra outgoing messages or invoking other, other applications, okay? All of the side effect is encoded, embodied, um, in the response of this computer sent back to the database layer, and this database layer handles this outgoing messages and, and state updates of this service atomically. It sends it to the other database uh, for um, service two to be handled. And let's say now something happens in between, an error also still occurs, right? If that occurs, everything's rolled back for, to a consistent point in time before, and we reinvoke from that consistent point in time, reinvoke each individual service. Okay. Now, because each invocation uh, from the database to the service layer is now encapsulated, um, encapsulated meaning that the recache contains everything the computation needs and response contains all the side effects, this retry is effectively idempotent. So this is the big idea. Uh, it sound, might sound very complicated, but this is all handled by stateful functions so that the compute here does not need to worry about a failures at all in the application code. And this exactly is the approach that stateful functions is taking with um, what distributed stateful application architecture should look like. So apart from the separate function processes, we also have now a statefun cluster. And this statement cluster is in charge of messaging and state handling. 
Okay, and because we're borrowing a lot of techniques from stream processing, the, the runtime of stateful functions is built exactly on top of Apache Flink. And as I mentioned, all messages sent to and from functions, as well as function state changes, are routed through the cluster using the simple HTTP request reply protocol. Now, this protocol makes sure that the computer, these functions, they still remain stateless or be able to do stateless, uh, a stateful logic. Okay. Now, if you come from Flink, you would also know that uh, with string processing, handle these uh, interactions between services as a data flow, we, we no longer need a database to actually provide this consistency and durability. What stateful function actually does is that periodically and asynchronously, it snapshots all the state across all the functions consistently to mass storage, let's say AWS S3, okay? So this is done periodically. Now, what is really, really cool here is that out of box, we have messaging and state consistency as if all messages are processed exactly once by all services, as if there were no failures and there is no database intervening in this architecture. So this is pretty nice. Now for the remaining, uh, oh, sorry. Well, one last thing is that uh, we also mentioned that the invocation itself, this protocol, makes the computer remain stateless, right? Operation-wise, it is stateless. So operation is very flexible. Function deployments are stateless processes. So it is still straightforward to deploy and elastically scale them on any modern cloud native infrastructure. It's like Kubernetes, um, API gateways, or on some function as a service, uh, popular function as a service, let's say, um, AWS Lambda, okay? And it's super easy to do rolling upgrades of these individual functions and also adding new functions to the application. As you have a new service that needs to participate in the logic and existing functions needs to start sending messages to that new function. All of this can be done without any downtime with the state from cluster, which is super nice, okay? So you still retain the benefits of what a serve, what a stateless um, application look like, but with a state from cluster in place, now actually having st uh, stateful logic is much more easier to to maintain. So for the remaining um, five minutes or so, I want to quickly skim through uh, what code function code would would look like and what you would need to do to actually deploy your application. So. Um, again, an overview, as a developer, you would write several functions and you would also um, run the state fund cluster to help manage your messaging and state between all of these functions. So one thing you would do is develop functions using a language SDK, okay? So without going too much into detail, you can see here that uh, this is the Java SDK. Uh, the Python SDK side would be almost identical to, to this um, in terms of concepts and um, uh, Syntax-wise, it also looks pretty similar. So you would receive a message and you would see whether or not it is, it is the message. So let's say we're, we're looking at the inventory function now. And the inventory function from our, our um, data flow that we just described, is it expecting reserved messages? If it isn't, then something must have been wrong. Okay, so we throw this illegal state exception. Um, otherwise, it should be a reserve. If it is a reserve, we access our state. Now from the function, code uh, user space, it would be as if you would actually be working with a storage to process, to, to manipulate and store your state. But of course we know that this storage actually is on the stateful function side. Nothing is really cached or maintained um, as state in the computer of the function side, okay? So you would access storage. Now here it's called address scope storage, meaning that let's say this invocation is actually for inventory um, socks, which is the ID socks. What you would see in the storage is specifically for the inventory socks. So you would see, okay, I still have um, X number of socks inventory. I do a check of the stock and reserve and maybe also update um, the storage that I have left in this, in this um, for socks. And after this um, stateful logic, you would do um, you want to send back uh, a message to the caller, which is the user function, which which send out this reservation, saying, okay, um, this is the, uh, the acknowledgement of your reserve, um, go ahead, right? Now here, I'm simplifying things. Uh, the address, the destination address of this message 
is the caller of this of this of this invocation, which would be that user function, right? But you could you could also do um, address this directly using logical addresses to let's say another new function, just like I said, using a function type and also the ID of that function instance you're trying to invoke. Okay. Now, last of all, after you've implemented this stateful function. Um, you would you would want to expose this function uh, via some HTTP service, right? So it's also pretty simple. Um, for each function that you want to participate in this specific service, uh, you would do inventory. You would you would define a stateful function spec. The specs defines a few things, including what state participates for this uh, specific function, what I what state I want to be declared, and also how to um, um, create new instances of this of this um, inventory function. Okay, You will register the spec with a stateful functions registry, which in turn provides you with a request reply handler. Now this handler is where the request reply protocol, which I mentioned before, is actually implemented. Okay, um, you, could, you just need to expose this handler with an HTTP server, start the server, and now you have a function that is invocable from stateful function, the stateful function cluster. Now, the next step, obviously, would be to actually make this visible in the Stefan cluster, right? And the way you would do that is compose a module specification YAML file um, to a specific, yeah, specification YAML file to um, define the service endpoints of the participating functions. Okay, so that's the second step. Now, this is just a an example of what that YAML file might look like. You define um, endpoints, and one endpoint would be this thing. So you would say all functions. Oh, by the way, something that I might have not uh, been clear about, clear about uh, before is that all functions are identified by a namespace and a name. So for example, this inventory function here, it is identified by the namespace com.my.org, and then the name of the function is called inventory. Okay. So it has a namespace and a name. Now, the way you would define this in the YAML spec is, um, so all functions under this specific namespace should go to this URL with a templated um, format. So this actually works quite nice with some, um, let's, for example, a Nginx or let's say um, AWS API Gateway, where you can now dynamically add functions under a given namespace. If you actually still need to um, add new namespaces to your application, you still need to restart um, your stateful function cluster because this is where this YAML would need to be provided. It, it, it needs to, that's it needs to be provided to the stateful function cluster, um, but under um, non-changing na constant namespaces, you can just add functions into your application as you as you wish. Okay, so this all is all is dynamic without any downtime on the stateful function cluster. And that, bas that is basically it. There is some more details on also how to define ingresses and egresses for your functions, but this is uh, the majority of what an application developer for stateful functions um, would need to do. Develop functions and then configure the stateful cluster to be able to connect to these uh, function endpoints. So finally, um, just very quickly, let's go through a future roadmap. Um, right now, uh, one thing that I find most important is actually providing IDLs uh, or interface definition languages for functions. Right now, as you can see, it's based on just raw message passing um, from functions to other functions. It would be nice if we actually have some IDLs in place to provide a more easily understandable abstraction um, of how functions or services interact with each other, right? You can think of this more or less somewhat similar to what gRPC provides. Like you can just write an IDL with text and that automatically generates uh, the server code for you. This is somewhat um, what we're thinking about in terms of making it easier to develop um, simple function applications. And also more higher level messaging primitives. This goes hand in hand with the IDLs. Um, right now, it is just one asynchronous fire and forget messages between functions. But I'm thinking about actually expanding that a bit more. And also very importantly is to introduce more language SDKs into 
the what we currently provide. Um, we already have already have a GoLang SDK on the pipeline um, to be contributed and maybe available in the upcoming release. Okay. Um, I oh one last thing. Uh, here are some links. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the this uh, slides would be available to download after um, the conference. So here are some uh, links for you to check out if you want to further understand what uh, read about Cephal functions. I would personally uh, recommend starting with the tutorials and examples at the Flink State Fun Playground repository. There's a lot of examples there for. Um, patterns of how you would um, design stateful function applications, and also, for example, how you would deploy on, let's say, AWS Lambda or Kubernetes. OK. I think that covers up uh, this talk. And thank you. I don't think we have um, time for questions, but um, I'm pretty excited to hear from you in the breakout session. Currently, there are also not, uh, no questions from the audience yet. Okay. But let's give them a little bit of time. Um, so what kind of use cases is this? Um, can, can you talk a little bit more about the use cases that this uh, framework is designed for? Are there? Yeah. Are you aware of any users or, or projects that have that, that are being built with uh, stateful functions? Yeah, one thing I can uh, confidently say about is it, it is a natural match for, um, let's say, digital twin pattern type of applications. Um, in this, in the shopping cart scenario, that is one example of what a digital twin means, right? You would have a entity, uh, which is a function, a user or inventory, or let's say it's a ride sharing application. You would have a ride coordinator. You had a driver tracking the locations. All of this, it's a pretty um, natural programming match model-wise um, for stateful function applications. And it's also what we're seeing quite a lot um, uh, for our first few users.